Well, turn to uh, Genesis chapter 50. We're going to, uh, in a sense, conclude the, the last chapter of the book of Genesis here. And um, we, if you've uh, missed any of the messages, we have all 150 in the back there for you that you can pick up. No, we, it's been about a two-year study, so it's probably been a, a, a hundred, uh, uh, coming up on a, about a hundred messages that we've, uh, and studies that we've uh, done together here in the book of Genesis. And it is so foundational and so important. We're going to come back next week and just go back and do a little summary, uh, an overview of the book. There's so many uh, great, important highlights uh, to help us have a, what we'd say, a Christian worldview so we can understand the, the world that, uh, that we live in, the fact that uh, God created the world, we would say, and he says over and over again, and that it was good, but because of the fall, then he came up with a good plan. We're going to point that out, the fact that Joseph believed in that. Uh, in that, uh, that good plan that he had for his life and in terms of the, keeping the promises made in Genesis 3.15 uh, that he would bring from the seed of the woman a Messiah that would uh, save the world. Uh, that uh, promise then expounded upon through Abraham and that covenant reiterated through Isaac, Jacob, and uh, Joseph certainly well aware of that plan and the dreams that God gave him before he was sold into slavery at 17. And now we're going to see to the end of his life at 110, still believing and trusting those uh, promises of God. A great example of faith, and certainly that of Jacob as well, as we kind of have the uh, final scene of Jacob, as he is um, taken back to the land of Israel to be buried, which was his command, uh, uh, really at his last dying breath, uh, as we saw last week after uh, those two studies we did on the prophecies of Jacob talking about his sons, but uh, what would happen in regards to those sons would be uh, in the last days. Uh, let's take a look at the, uh, the mourning process beginning here in the first six verses. Then Joseph fell on his father's face and wept over him and kissed him. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. So the physicians embalmed Israel. Forty days were required for him. So such, for such are the days required for those who are embalmed. And the Egyptians mourned for him seventy days. Now when the days of his mourning were past, Joseph spoke to the household of Pharaoh, saying, If now I have found favor in your eyes, please speak in the hearing of Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear, saying, Behold, I am dying in my grave, which I dug for myself in the land of Canaan. There you shall bury me. Now therefore, Please let me go up and bury my father, and I will come back. And Pharaoh said, go up and bury your father as he made you swear. So uh, the process of this morning, of course, uh, this morning begins uh, uh, very emotionally as we see Joseph uh, embracing his father. And again, he, he basically, as we'll see, has risen to the leadership position uh, in his church, uh, in his church, in his family, uh, in the tribe of, of Jacob. Uh, as, uh, again, the older sons kind of disqualify themselves through what we've seen has been pr pretty radical sin uh, in, uh, in their lives <laughs> and, and, uh, uh, and the details of that we've uh, looked at in the past. And, of course, with the passing of Joseph, all that's going to rise predicted by uh, Jacob to Judah, uh, who would uh, really rise to the, the front of the leadership of the nation of Israel. But notice verse 1 again, Then Joseph fell on his father's face, and wept over him and, and kissed him. He had done that 17 years earlier after, again, not seeing his father uh, all of those years, uh, living all of his life primarily in Egypt, and then that reunion once, uh, uh, once again. We see Joseph several times weeping, uh, revealing himself, chapter 45, to his brothers. I'm Joseph. I'm the one you sold into slavery. It's really me. You know, they uh, only know him as the uh, prime minister, the viceroy, uh, the Lord over the land who held uh, life and death in his hands. Uh, and they're crying out for uh, him to spare their lives and so forth. And then he reveals himself and they're in shock and they're afraid. And uh, he weeps over them. And uh, we've all, often mentioned, again, the way that Joseph typifies uh, Jesus Christ in, uh, in so many ways. And this is one. Isaiah the prophet said of Jesus that he was a man of sorrows, or he would be, and he was, a man of sorrows uh, acquainted with grief. And we would say Joseph was uh, as well. But every time we see him weeping, it's never for himself, it's always for someone else. You know, he's never a guy that, uh, that said, uh, you know, oh God, how, did you, how could you allow this to happen to me? To be sold into slavery, to be a slave, to be accused falsely of this sexual crime, 
and even though he was innocent, thrown into a dungeon and so forth, and goes through the, not just a few days or a couple of weeks, but years of that experience, but never, it's never a poor me, never crying for himself. All of his tears were always over the concern uh, of others. And, uh, and certainly we've all kind of experienced this mourning process if you've uh, lost someone. And, uh, and of course he's saying uh, those things uh, to his dad, hoping he could hear, but of course he can't. And, uh, and I've seen it uh, repeated uh, uh, many times, uh, all those things that are being said uh, that of course you wish you had said sooner. So just, you know, an aside, you know, to say them now, you know, that uh, life, life does come to an end. Certainly that's, that's part of what we're seeing here with Jacob and, and with Joseph uh, in the parting of uh, a son and a father that were, were very close. Uh, and then the process uh, continues as Jacob, the father, is being embalmed. And uh, again, just to say a, a few things about that, because we're in Egypt, and there would be an, uh, an assumption that the, uh, you know, the Egyptians embalmed uh, Jacob in the same way they would have uh, embalmed uh, the pharaohs. Uh, but there's uh, language here that indicates that's not the process. And uh, you know, it, is, it is fascinating, it's interesting, that it's only been uh, in the last few years that scientists were finally able to figure out how the Egyptians did it in terms of the mummification process and uh, and everything and they they've actually uh, got got it figured out now and uh, but it took them a very long time uh, but the Egyptians did it because they believed under their religious system that if they went through and it was the priest that did it if they did it and then entombed that Pharaoh at his death of course, then all of his servants and everything went into the tomb alive and died with him so they could be with him and quote the afterlife. It's interesting, the ancient civilization that recognized there is an, a an afterlife. There, there is something else uh, that's there. One of our trips to uh, China on, uh, on the last one, we actually got to go to uh, Xi'an uh, and go to the, um, see the terracotta soldiers and uh, all of these you know, clay figures that were built to exact specification. You look at their faces, they're all different, they're all individual, and so an entire army that the emperor wanted created and buried with him because he believed in an afterlife, he just didn't know how to get there. Uh, it's a faulty belief system, certainly, for him as well as for these Egyptians here, but, uh, and so we have the language that would indicate that uh, Jacob is buried or mummified, in a sense, by physicians not by those religious priests. In other words, uh, it's purely for utilitarian reasons so that they can get him uh, to the land of, uh, of Israel. But notice in terms of the Egyptians, uh, it says the Egyptians wept for him 70 days. That would have been the length of time for a pharaoh, for a king. In other words, this was a, a national days uh, of mourning. Why? Because, uh, well, because he's, he is Joseph's father. Joseph, who is the savior of North Africa, who saved not only that tribe, those people coming down, his brothers uh, and, uh, and their children and so forth. He saved a, a huge portion of the population through his prediction interpretation of those dreams. Seven years of, of plenty, seven years of famine, storing the grain. And remember in the end, the people uh, rejoiced over Joseph uh, and said, uh, you have saved us. Uh, and, uh, and so he is still in that position. I find this also interesting, again, that, that the father is glorified through the work of the son. Again, even as Jesus said, I have not come to do my will, but the will of the one who sent me. And always that uh, God the father would be glorified, and he would be ultimately through his uh, death on the cross for our sins. But the process uh, begins, and it's a difficult one. There's an emotional aspect. There's a practical aspect to it. Uh, let's look at ne next, verse 7 to 14, this uh, necessary permission, and then the, uh, the journey up to Israel. Verse 7, so Joseph went up to bury his father, and with him he went up all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his house, and all the elders of the land of Egypt, as well as the house of Joseph, his brothers, and his father's house, only their little ones, their flocks and their herds, they left in the land of Goshen. 
Uh, and there they went up with him, both chariots and horsemen, and it was a very great gathering. Then they came to the threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond the Jordan, and they mourned there with a great and very solemn lamentation. He observed seven days of mourning for his father in the, when the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning of the threshing floor of Atad. They said, this is a deep mourning of the Egyptians. Therefore, its name was called Abel uh, Mazarim, which is beyond the Jordan. So his sons did for him just as he had commanded them. For his sons carried him to the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave of the field at Machpelah before Mamre, which Abraham bought with the field from Ephron the Hittite as property for a burial place. And after he had buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt, he and his brothers and all who went up with him to bury his father. So again, he does get permission from Pharaoh. I think it's just kind of protocol. Uh, he sends someone else. He's probably in, in a time of, of mourning himself. So he sends someone to basically let Pharaoh know that he's going. You know, we have the remarks that he is the Lord over the land. He's like a father unto Pharaoh and, uh, and so forth. But uh, this is going to be uh, quite an entourage that, uh, that goes up uh, with him. Uh, and so he lets them know that it's going to happen. There are three groups of people that go with him just to get a, a sense of the scale of what's going on. Verse 7, note that the elders of the land of Israel, excuse me, of Egypt go up for the burial. And we know from, from the archaeological remains and uh, manuscript evidence uh, that we have that typically the elders of Egypt were anywhere from three to 500 people, depending upon the dynasty. So that's, that's one group of people. And... Um, uh, these are the princes, the rulers, and the leaders of that particular nation, which at the time happens to be the most powerful nation on the planet. And, uh, and I'm thinking they might have taken a few folks with them. So you've got three to 500 plus, you know, add another five or so uh, with them. You have Jacob's family. This is all of Jacob's family, kids, grandkids, uh, maybe not the great grandkids that we're going to read about uh, in a moment, only their little ones, their flocks, their herds remain behind. And then you have the military. They are mentioned in verse 9. Uh, and there went up with him both chariots and horsemen. And it was a very great gathering. So that is a reference to uh, the military that would have gone with them. They're not going to go to a foreign country with the leaders of this nation, with the prime minister uh, of this nation, without the Secret Service and the Marine Corps. So they're, that's, that's the reference there to the military. The chariots uh, and the horsemen. Uh, these are not, uh, uh, again, vehicles that uh, would have been uh, taking just for uh, out for an afternoon cruise. Uh, it was quite an entourage. So you got a couple thousand people uh, at least making this journey. Uh, again, it's interesting that uh, uh, they arrive at the threshing floor of Atad, which is uh, across from Jericho, across the Jordan, present-day Jordan. Uh, again, so they, they don't take the, the, uh, the most expedient route. Uh, they actually would, would have gone around the Dead Sea, up through the plains of Jordan, present-day Jordan, till they get about even with Jericho. And at that point, at the threshing floor of Atad, they stop uh, and basically begin this ceremony in this time of, of mourning, uh, which is interesting because that is the root of the Exodus uh, 400 years later. Moses' writing also uses very similar language as he does then. There were the servants of Pharaoh, the flocks, the herds, the chariots, the horsemen, a great company. Moses, again, the writer, uses the same language. This is, a, in a sense, a precursor to the Exodus because they're going because of the promised land, and, uh, which they would leave for 400 years later, taking the same uh, root. Verse 10, noted that it's a solemn uh, lamentation. New Living helps us a little bit. It says they had a very great and solemn memorial service. Uh, and this one's a Jewish one. It lasts seven, seven days. Uh, and at that point, uh, they would then move on. Now just the family to go across to the, uh, <coughs> to the cave at Machpelah where Abraham bought, you remember, the field and the cave for a burial he does it because he believes God is going to give his descendants the land, so he wants to be buried in the land. Uh, Isaac believes that God is giving them the land. God promised them the land. God will keep his word, so he is buried there with his wife. Jacob believes that God's going to give them the land uh, in the future to their descendants, so he makes his children 
promise that they will take uh, and bury him there, uh, and they are fulfilling that. Notice uh, verse uh, 11, the, uh, the Canaanites had quite a response. Uh, they watched all of this going on, and of course there was a, a large amount of Egyptians that were there, and so they renamed the area afterwards Abel Merzim, which means, uh, again, Abel mourning, and Merzim means Egyptian. So the mourning of Egypt, they see, is uh, taking place. They don't really fully understand what's going on, but they know this person is somebody uh, very, very uh, important. And, uh, and so the, this process of the, the mourning uh, continues. They have the permission to go, and they're keeping a promise that they made to their father and, uh, and we would say that, uh, uh, you know, the mourning for them would have been, the, you know, the sackcloth and ashes, and uh, uh, the, it would have been very Jewish, of course. Uh, and our funerals, again, should be the same in the sense that we realize that there is a mourning, but we're mourning for ourselves. We never mourn for the person that's gone. For the person who's the believer in Jesus Christ, yes, they've departed. Yes, their physical body is still here with us, but they're with the Lord. They're rejoicing, uh, and they're just having a great time. So we're not really mourning for, for them. Uh, we're mourning for ourselves because we're not with them. We can't see them. We can't talk to them, and, uh, uh, and so forth. And we know there's going to be a time gap you know, until we are with them again, but we know that we will be with them again. And so the Bible says, as believers, that we do not weep or mourn as those in the world weep. Uh, and so, you know, for us, as, uh, as we have those times, it's uh, certainly a sad time, but it's a sad, uh, joyful <laughs> celebration, difficult time that, uh, that we go through. But it's also a great time, uh, as, uh, as we've said on many occasions, to, to share the gospel. I mentioned my, you know, meeting with my mom ahead of time. And she's saying, yeah, I want this song, I want this song, and I want you to preach the gospel. Um, I had an opportunity to do uh, uh, Kathy's uh, Auntie Irene's memorial service at Waikiki uh, last, last Saturday night. And beautiful sunset. It was just a great opportunity. She was a uh, uh, love the Lord, solid believer, and gave those instructions. Those are good instructions to leave with somebody. Make sure there's somebody there that's going to uh, uh, preach, uh, preach the gospel. And so uh, it's a lot easier for me because it's like, that's why I'm here. It's, uh, you know, it's no hesitancy. And, uh, and it, was, uh, it was just a blessing to be there and knowing that uh, there was a lot of, a lot of folks that uh, probably have never been to church, maybe never go to church, never uh, heard the name of Jesus other than when somebody stepped on somebody's toe or something. And uh, to just kind of hear the whole, the whole story. That, hey, Jesus died for you. He loves you. Hey, you can go to heaven. You just need to accept his grace and his forgiveness. And that's what we call the good news. The Canaanites were there. Tremendous response. Uh, it's a solemn occasion, but uh, it's one in which they are keeping a promise uh, to their dad. Uh, notice also the permission allowed them to, uh, again, obey as they cross over to go to uh, this, uh, this tomb. Now, we kind of, I showed you a picture of it uh, last week and everything and talked about the fact that you can understand why this tomb, the tomb of Abraham and Sarah, again, were Isaac, Rebecca, and now Jacob, and of course, interesting, not Rachel, but Leah, are buried there together, why this would be so important uh, as a religious site to Jewish people through the centuries and, and today, because those guys and their wives being buried there were buried there believing that God would keep his word, believing that God's promises will always uh, come true. And, uh, and so it becomes a very special site. Of course, we've, we know that uh, in the ensuing years when the, the uh, Muslims took over that area, that they uh, do what they do with a lot of Jewish sites in the land, unfortunately, is they plaster over what's there, literally with plaster to cover the, uh, the shrine and everything. Uh, build a mosque and put up a couple of minarets and make it a Muslim holy site. And of course, uh, uh, that area is in Hebron today, an area of dispute. And so very difficult for Jewish people to get there. And I mentioned some of the horrific uh, things on both sides that have been carried out uh, uh, in terms of uh, loss of life and so forth as uh, people are there trying to worship and, uh, and celebrate. But it's still a very special site uh, to this day. The mourning process, permission to bury. Let's look at the plea as we get to the brothers. And uh, very, uh, uh, if you haven't read ahead, this is, uh, uh, 
you know, you wouldn't see this coming in terms of uh, where the brothers are at in this whole process. Verse 15, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, perhaps Joseph will hate us and may actually repay us for all the evil which we did to him. So they sent messengers to Joseph saying, before your father died, he commanded saying, thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespass of your brothers and their sin, for they did evil to you. Now please forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we are your servants. Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am, am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, in order to bring it about as it is to this day, to save many people alive. Now therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. So again, the, the brothers here plead for mercy. Uh, the occasion is because their father is, is dead. And it's not like he just died. I mean, there's, we've, we've got a, like a two-month two month gap. You know, you've got, or at least, you've got the, the 70 days of mourning there in Egypt. You've got, a, even at a pretty good pace, you've got about an 11-day trek uh, to get up there to the plains of Jordan. You have that burial for seven days on back. So it's not like, well, they're just kind of out of their minds with grief. No, they're just kind of out of their minds. Uh, because their issue is they're just having a real hard time accepting the grace of God, right? I mean, they're just really struggling with this issue. People struggle with this issue. I mean, to say that God will just forgive you because you ask for forgiveness, yes. He tells you to turn and repent from your sins, but just accept the fact that Jesus died in your place on the cross. Paul says that he that had no sin became sin for us so that in him we might become the, righteous, uh, the righteousness of God. Paul says in Ephesians 2, 8 that we're saved by grace through faith. It's, it's not of ourselves. It's not of works. Paul says so that no one can boast. Again, uh, it's often been said that there's a hundred steps between us and God. And God has taken 99 towards us and he's asking us to take the one. And, uh, you know, those of us that have come to know him uh, understand that, that we're saved by grace and his grace alone. It's not a merit thing. Everything we do in terms of this life and our relationship with God is simply a response. We love him because he first loved us. <laughs> it's uh, like that song that uh, we sing sometimes that uh, uh, we just, you know, we just want to serve him because he loves us. I mean, whatever we do. Uh, uh, those guys came and gals and cleaned and painted for several hours yesterday to, I hope, because they love the Lord. It wasn't because I stood up here for an hour and a half and said, if you really love Jesus, <laughs> you'll be in that hallway on Saturday morning. You know, No, we don't do things by manipulation. It's, it's just a response. Uh, it's how we respond to the Lord uh, because it's all by grace. Uh, it's like the guy that is very concerned because he keeps falling into the same sin over and over and over and says to his pastor, will God continue to forgive me? And he said, well, yeah, what do you think? Do you think he deserved it the first time? No, it was by grace. And if it's the 99th or the 199th or the 1099th time and you need to come to God and ask for forgiveness by his grace, he will forgive you again. And the brothers are having a hard time with that idea. Part of the problem is they're really projecting their, their own feelings on Joseph. They're assuming Joseph, Joseph is like them, and, uh, and Joseph is not like them at all. They're like the guy that broke down on the side of the road one night. It's 2 o'clock in the morning. It's raining. Uh, he's in the middle of the country somewhere. Uh, he goes to change his flat tire, which is the problem. He doesn't have a lug wrench, but he can see a couple miles down the road, there's a light on in a farmhouse. So he decides, well, I don't really have any choice. Uh, I, I'm not going to stand out here in the rain all night. So he begins to walk down. 
But he's also thinking as he's walking down there, he's thinking, oh, man, I can just see me knocking on this guy's door. I uh, get the guy up at 2 o'clock in the morning. He's not going to be real thrilled about it. And, you know, he's probably going to, who are you? And, you know, and he's like, you know, but I don't know why the guy would think that. You know, I'm broken down. I'm the guy in the road. I mean, he's been sleeping in a warm bed. I'm not sleeping around. I'm out here suffering. I, I need some help here, you know. And it's, I don't know why the guy would even think that, you know. And, and by the time he gets there and he knocks on the door and the farmer comes out and says, uh, uh, who is it? He says, you know who it is. You, I'm standing out here in the rain, and I don't care how, how mad you're going to get. In fact, I don't even watch your lug rats. If it was the last one on the earth, I wouldn't even take it. And he just walked back to his car. Pro of course, none of, nobody here does that. We don't, we don't project our, our feelings on, uh, on others. We don't assume, because that's what the brothers are doing, right? That's what they would have done. If they were Joseph, it would have been, this is payback time here. Yeah, dad's not around anymore. You sold me as a slave. You were considering killing me. And when I begged for my life, you laughed and you ate your lunch. Well, listen, buddy, I got something to say to you now. Dad's not. See, they're thinking that, that there's an admission that what they did was evil. I mean, it's, that's in their own words. Wow, what we did him was so evil. What's he going to do to us now? They're having a real hard time accepting this idea of grace. And, uh, and sometimes we can be that way ourselves. But notice uh, their reaction again. Uh, they are filled with anxiety, the text says. Their father's dead. It's been for, been for a couple of months. Uh, they probably have been worried about this uh, for a few months, uh, afraid that uh, Joseph might uh, repay them. Uh, but again, their fears were unfounded. They were irrational given the fact that, well, how has Joseph treated them? I mean, from, from the recognition and their repentance. And we, we know from our study that Joseph, as a very young man, forgave him a long time ago. There's no bitterness of heart. He keeps his relationship uh, open with the Lord. He even names his children in names, Manasseh and Ephraim, that would indicate that he's forgiven them a long time ago. He doesn't know if he can be reconciled. That depends on them. Depends if they've ever repented, they've ever changed. And he finds out through this incredible, brilliant strategy that he enacts upon them as they come down for food during the, that time of famine, that he finds out, in fact, they have repented. And we have that beautiful speech of uh, Judah, who rises to the occasion, in a sense, to plead for the lives of him and his brothers, even willing to give his own life in a substitutionary way uh, for their younger brother, Benjamin. And it's a great, uh, beautiful scene there in chapter 45. What's Joseph's reaction? He weeps over them. It's me, and he embraces them. He provides for them. He sends carts and everything, and they bring everybody back down. He takes them. They introduce them to Pharaoh. He gives them the best. They've been there for 17 years. They've been prospering. There's, there's no hint of, uh, of this at all. And then they concoct this whole story <laughs> about their father. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Did we mention that? And dad said, uh, dad said, our dad, your dad said, oh, you better make sure you forgive these guys. They, they make up this whole lie. <laughs> They're going to the, there, there's no hint anywhere that Jacob would ever see any of this. Jacob thought nothing but the best for Joseph. He recognized his character and God's hand upon him and so forth. Jacob would have never said that. And so they're like, yeah, after all, you should forgive me. There's a higher authority over you, you know. And, uh, and it's just, uh, it's kind of so twisted. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, you know, Joseph's response is to just weep. You know, that they just, wow, is that what they think of me? Yeah, I wonder how often God's heart breaks and weeps when he thinks, is, is that what they think of me? They don't still really understand grace. They don't understand my love. Uh, there's a couple of lessons, certainly, we want to learn from Joseph, but also from, from these brothers. So they make their appeal for forgiveness. Notice they, they don't even have the guts initially to go. They send messengers, you know, with this uh, concocted uh, story to plead for uh, forgiveness. <laughs> and, of course, we've already looked at it, and we'll look at it again in a moment to kind of help solidify uh, Joseph's position in all this in terms of understanding the sovereignty of God. Uh, but we obviously are trying to learn to forgive as well. And Paul makes an appeal for forgiveness uh, based on our relationship with Christ in Ephesians 4.30. There's where he says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, 
anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted. And here's why. Forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. It's going to grieve the Holy Spirit if you don't forgive. Yeah, but they don't deserve it. Yeah, neither did these brothers. Joseph did it anyway. Paul says we should do it because God has forgiven us. God has shown us his love. We should be able to love others. God has show, show, shown his grace. We should be able to be gracious to others. Uh, be kind and tenderhearted. Don't grieve the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. Look at these things. Bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking. These are things that are going to be part of our lives if we don't learn to forgive. So be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving, even as Christ forgave us. Uh, Joseph then will, again, we would say, make his plea by referencing the sovereignty of God. Uh, again, in verse 17, he weeps as they uh, spoke to him. And uh, again, as they project you know, their, own, their own personalities and their own thought process on him, which was uh, irrational. Uh, notice he says he has no desire to play God, verse 19. Do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? Uh, kind of. <laughs> he was the Lord over the land. Uh, kind of. He could have said, uh, could you please kill all these guys right here? Because they bother me. And it would have been done at the blink of an eye. I mean, he's little G, he's, he's kind of like that. But uh, obviously, the power, it never goes to his head. Uh, he's saying, man, are you kidding? I'm not in the place of God. I mean, who, who am I? You know, I forgive you guys a, a long time ago. And, and again, that's, that's where we, we need to be as well. Uh, he, didn't, he didn't want his pound of flesh. He didn't want some kind of divine justice uh, met out. I, I saw this on, on Facebook this week. I, I don't know if it was Photoshopped or not, but it was... Uh, picture of a, a billboard of the kind that we don't have in Hawaii praise the Lord but the kind that they have on the mainland is the, the big giant ones and on the bottom it said United States Marine Corps and then there was a quote on the top that said uh, God will bring vengeance on the terrorist our job is to make sure they're introduced okay. I think that went through I don't think they're preaching the gospel to them but uh, uh, God God was the one that should mete out vengeance and that needs to be our perspective. It was never a concern of, of Joseph. Oh, am I in the place of God? No, I don't need to step in and go, yeah, you hard me here. So I got some punishment figured out for you. Like, I'm not going to talk to you for the rest of the week. I'm not going to do this. I'm going to always treat you this. I'm always going to remind you in the past. I might, not, I might take, not take a weapon to you, but I have my ways of meeting out a little justice here. And, uh, and Joseph says, I'm not going to do that. Uh, I'm in no position to do that. And then, of course, secondly, we say he had discerned God's good providence uh, in their evil. Kind of the, the classic uh, uh, verse here in verse 20 that we've made reference to many times, and maybe the capstone of, uh, of the whole story. But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about, as it is to this day, to save many people alive. He's saying, yeah, you meant it for evil, but you know what? It's okay because God was using it. God had a plan, and he allowed it. He needed you to get me in the pit so I could be sold into slavery, so I could be in that caravan, so I could arrive on the auction block just in time so Potiphar could bid on me, so I could get to his house, so I could be rise to his highest position, so I'd actually be in the home, uh, be his personal servant over his entire estate, so that his wife would be there and try to seduce me, which I wouldn't fall for, so that I could be falsely accused, so I could get to that dungeon. That was the real thing. I needed to get to the dungeon in time so that when the uh, the baker and when the cupbearer had those dreams I would be there to interpret them so I could wait there for another two years in the dungeon so that eventually when Pharaoh has his dreams they could say oh we know a guy that can interpret the dreams and then I would get in there interpret the dreams and then I would become the prime minister so it's all good but but he was able to say it was all good not after he's the prime minister I mean see that's where we're at prime minister yeah I think I could do that that's good but you know he's good in the dungeon He's good even when he's falsely accused of raping somebody. I don't know if you thought that through. That'd be kind of a horrific thing. There's a lot of people that would unfriend you on Facebook right there. I'll just tell you that, you know. <laughs> but he's, he's even good with that. Because he believes that 
<coughs> God created everything and it was good. But the fall of man came in and things became sinful. But then God developed a good plan. And he knew that God was good and he could trust that plan, even if it was painful uh, in his own life. And that's what he's expressing here uh, to his brothers. Remember back in chapter 45, we called it the big reveal, where he finally uh, tells his brothers who he is. Remember, he points to the same idea, the sovereignty of God. In verse 5 of that chapter, he says, But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life. It was, it, God was orchestrating these events. He makes four other references in that chapter, in that speech to his brothers. In verse 7, he says, And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. In verse 8 he says, So now it was not you who sent me here, but God. In verse 9, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. He's very, very explicit in the juxtaposition between God's providence and what they did. Verse 5, You sold me, God sent me. Not you, but God. This guy gets it in terms of completely understanding all of the events in his life were all directed by God. And he's able to embrace that and that's what leads to his forgiveness. Uh, and, and I don't think without that, it's a struggle. We should forgive others because Christ forgave us. It should help us to forgive others if we believe in the sovereignty of God and that God has a plan. God allowed it to happen. It was rotten. It was lousy. It was no good. I wouldn't have chosen it. But if I wait, if I trust long enough in the end, I'm going to see how God was orchestrating events uh, for good. And the ultimate example of that uh, is Jesus Christ, who could have said from the cross, what you mean for evil, God will use for good. What was the ultimate evil in the history of mankind? The crucifixion on a Roman cross of Jesus Christ. What was the ultimate good for all mankind? The crucifixion of Jesus Christ on a Roman cross so that he could be sworn by a professional executor that he was dead, placed in a tomb, and three days later, rise again from the dead. A proof of who he was as our Savior, and that we too would rise again as well. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will not die, Jesus said. Of course, then he said, do you believe this? Because that's our part, is to respond to what he's done for us. It's an astonishing revelation, again, that God creates everything good, and that he thus has a good plan. The other verse that we kind of coupled with this, remember, was Jeremiah 29, 11, kind of the, cl the classic there. But the context is uh, the Jews are about ready to go into the Babylonian captivity. Their city has already been sacked a couple of times. Uh, many of them, thousands of them, have already been killed and taken into the captivity. There's been a little uh, rebellion again. Nebuchadnezzar is coming back the third time, and this time he ain't messing around. He burns the city to the ground, uh, and he, he sacks the city. Uh, thousands are killed. Those that survive are going to go into the captivity. And in that context, Jeremiah the prophet that's been warning these guys of all of this since he was about 17 or 18 years old, beginning his ministry, then says that, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for wholeness and not for evil plan to give you a future and a hope. When things look their worst, Jeremiah says, God still has a plan. And it's not just a, the big general plan of redemption, which certainly we all understand. It's a plan for your life individually. And guess what? It's a good plan. And it's not a plan to harm you. It's a plan to prosper you. And it's a plan to give you hope. And it's a plan to give you a future, even in your darkest day. Then, the Apostle Paul certainly picks up this theme uh, in Romans towards the end of the chapter in verse 28. Again, a very another uh, familiar verse. It begins with the words, and we know. So there's, a, there's the assumption that we believe what we're, we're going to read here. And we know that all things work together for good for those who love God to those who are the called according to his purpose. Again, the same idea. God is good, and God has a good plan. And even when things look bad, God is still good, and God still has a good plan. We just don't understand it. We can't see it right now. I don't really know why I needed to lose my job right now. I'm not really thrilled about that. But, but, <laughs> uh, you know, it's all things. Sometimes that's all we need to say, right? That, that's what comes to our mind, all things. I got a feeling this is one of those all things. 
If I wait long enough, if I trust long enough, if I don't get bitter, if I don't get angry, if I don't get dismayed, if I don't lose hope, if I recognize that God is good and has a good plan and I can trust him, I can see the good that God will bring out of it. It was true of Joseph. It was true of the Apostle Paul and Jeremiah. It's true of us as well. Paul goes on in that kind of classic passage in verse 31, again of Romans 8, and says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Again, why do we know that God is good? Simply because he said it? No, Paul says that, that uh, God demonstrated his love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for our sins. God wasn't looking for people that were already responding to him, showing him some kind of significance, praising him or worshiping in some way. No, nope. while we were in absolute rebellion, could care less against him, he sent his son to die for our sins, a demonstration of his love that he's good and that he's got a good plan for us. Again, so if you've never really truly believed this or embraced it, I'm just been to kind of help your marriage a little bit. <laughs> your relationship with other people around you. The ability to forgive. Again, God's enabling by his grace to be able to do it because we've been forgiven for all of our sins. Past, present. The ones you're committing right now because you're not listening to this sermon. And the ones in the future as well. I just threw that in for a few people. God's already forgiven you. Paid the total price. Therefore, we should forgive others. And it helps us to understand the story of Joseph and what he has to say in Genesis 50-20. And we again, we tried to help us remember at least the reference to it by saying that 20-20 um, vision that some of us used to have uh, meant that we could see things around us very clearly. But 50-20 vision will help us see things from God's perspective and know that he is good and has a good plan for us. The fourth thing is uh, Joseph will request a, a final promise, verse 22. So Joseph dwelt in Egypt in his father's household, and Joseph lived 110 years. Joseph saw Ephraim's children to the third generation. The children of Machir, the son of Manasseh, were also brought up on Joseph's knees. And Joseph said to his brethren, I am dying, but God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land to the land of which he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph took an oath from the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. So Joseph died, being 110 years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. So their request comes, this final promise, at the end of 110 years. So uh, we see him living again from the time he's 17 to 110 there uh, in Egypt, getting to experience not just the blessing of grandchildren, but great-grandchildren uh, as well. Uh, and uh, in the same way that Jacob officially adopted uh, Manasseh and Ephraim, it appears Joseph did the same thing uh, with some of his grandchildren, uh, the children of Machir. So, uh, so, you know, the blessings of his life towards the end. And of course, then we'd say a request for a final promise uh, made in faith. He's going to do what, what his dad did. Uh, he's not going to say, take me right now at the moment of my death. But he says, I know there's a time in the future. It's already prophesied they're going to be in a land of stra in stra with strangers for 400 years. I think uh, Joseph realizes this is it. You know, God brings them there so they can grow into a, a nation and prosper. Uh, but remember, the, uh, uh, the other pharaoh comes on the scene because uh, Joseph is, you know, part of the Hiskos dynasty that will go off the scene that were foreigners. And you've got uh, an Egyptian uh, pharaoh that takes over after that. And he remembers not Joseph. It's not that they didn't know who he was. It's just that uh, that... Uh, he's not Egyptian and I am. So we're going to kind of act like he was never here. Uh, and in terms of uh, uh, the concern over the Jews who have now grown so populous that they might, in a time of war, turn against them and they become enslaved. I think Joseph has a, certainly the 400 years, he has a sense of what's going on. And he says, just keep my bones here. But when that day comes, when God visits you, and, the, and it's a good connotation, it doesn't mean like visit you in judgment. It means come to rescue you and save you. When that day comes, 
then you take up my bones and you take them with you on the exodus and take them back into the land. That's his belief based on what God has said. And like his father, he's able to say in his dying breath, I believe God's word. I believe God's promises. And uh, man, may it be said, so of us as well. So much that he makes it into what we call the hall of fame and faith in Hebrews 11, verse 22. By faith, uh, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure. That's our word, exodus of the children of Israel and gave instructions concerning his bones. And that is exactly what they did when Moses and the children of Israel march out of Egypt. They are carrying the Ark of the Covenant and they are carrying the bones of Joseph. And they uh, to read the story in Exodus and they do get him back to the land and they do bury him there. Again, the faith of, uh, of Jacob, you know, believing the promises to the end of life, the same could be son, said of his son Joseph, but we learn, in a sense, so much from both of these guys, and they're, they're really contrasting. Think, you think about it, if you go back, <laughs> J- Jacob learned through what we might call the, uh, the school of faith, what it had for him been called the school of hard knocks. Because this is a guy that just was kind of rebellious, didn't always get it, did everything on his own, his own strength. That, that's what his name means, usurper, you know. In the vernacular, we might say, you know, dirty, sneaky thief, you know. And that's why when he finally submits to God, uh, and finally, uh, you know, comes under his authority, then God says, okay, I'll, I'll change your name. Man, I hope it's better than the last one. I'm going to call you Israel now, Govern, governed by God. And in our study on Wednesday night, Hosea, Hosea's got a little commentary on that whole struggle at night and the, uh, and the outcome of it. But here's a guy that had his ups and downs and ups and downs and, uh, with the Lord. But in the end, then he finally commits as we sang in that song that uh, Mark had just written, this idea of surrender and surrendering ourselves to the Lord, let him really be the Lord of our lives. Jacob finally gets that in the end. And then Joseph is the guy that he just gets it from day one. Teenager, goes to live in this very pagan, very sensual, sexual uh, place in Egypt by himself. But he's able to just walk with God, remain pure, trust God, forgive, extend grace. And he really is an example to us. Mm-hmm.